A very good afternoon from Singapore to the participants who joined us last week. Welcome again. This is the second installment of AVPN's Myanmar webinar series. My name is Stacy, and I am the Member Services Manager. We are very happy to see many of our members engaging in our webinars. But for the uninitiated, Asian Venture Philanthropy Network is a membership-based organization headquartered in Singapore working to promote venture philanthropy principles and methodologies in Asia. If you have further questions on AVPN, you can contact me later via email. Our session today will focus on international foundations in Myanmar. We have with us Ingrid Stanger, founder of Norwegian Foundation Partnership for Change, and Barbara Bauer, who is based in Myanmar, with us today. PFC has been active in the country for the last 18 months. Ingrid will give a 20 minutes presentation on PFC's activities in Myanmar, after which we will be conducting a Q&A session. Participants can type in their questions into the question box on the control panel during the presentation, and I will be collating them for Ingrid after her presentation. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email us and we also appreciate if you can fill in the very short survey at the end of the session. The webinar recording will be posted on our website within the week and we will also like to remind you to register for the final webinar on Myanmar which will happen in January. All information can be found on the AVPN website. Okay, I will now hand over the presentation to Ingrid. Hello everybody and thanks for listening. Um, I'm sitting in cold Norway with grey, uh, it's not even snow, it's sort of between snow and rain, so I hope you're enjoying warmer weather down in, in Southeast Asia or Asia, where, wherever you are situated. Uh, so I will present uh, some of our experiences so far in, in Myanmar, together with Barbara Bauer, our excellent uh, head of, of um, mission or, or executive officer of uh, our um, social innovation fund. Um, and I will just now, I'm sorry, I have to learn how I, how I move this. We are, as uh, Stacy said, we started 18 months ago in, uh, in Myanmar. We, are a social, we call us a social innovation fund. Uh, I will explain later where we are on the sort of um, continuum line uh, between grants and, and investments. We opened then in Myanmar uh, together with um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi as sort of the honorary president of the fund. She was in Norway in June to give her, her Nobel Peace Prize speech tw 21 years after she actually got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, this year the Peace Prize is, or actually today and yesterday, the Peace Prize is celebrated here in Oslo for the uh, for the, the uh, organization to uh, to destroy chemical weapons, which is also an enormously important organization. Uh, but back to, to our um, social innovation fund. I will um, talk about being, I'm sorry, this is, so the lesson, lessons learned we've had, um, I will talk about both being an international NGO in, in Myanmar, uh, how to prioritize, how we prioritize the projects, and how we run the projects and which projects we are running right now. And um, the first, uh, the, the first issue of being an international NGO in Myanmar. I'm sure some of you listeners are also NGOs and know the, the development of NGOs in Myanmar. Um, in, in goes or international NGOs started really to grow since the early 90s. Um, but many have been forbidden and many have been sort of undercover or running from abroad. There have also been a lot of private donors, people who have been traveling to, um, to Myanmar as tourists and seeing the extreme poverty there and then wanted to do something with it. So there are many private individuals who are running hospitals and schools all over, especially in the Kachin area. But of course that is a difficult situation for them because you really go down every second year and you give some money and you hope things work well. So uh, these, many of these are 
now merging with uh, or, or co cooperating with NGOs that are down there offici officially working. Of course, there is an increasingly um, hurry, <laughs> very increasing um, amount of, of government, international government aid, and it is so much coming in now that the the, the, the officials, the, the government people, are so sometimes uh, have a problem with having time to meet all the people that want to help them. So uh, this is a typical situation that we also see, of course, with uh, with crisis situations, like we remember from the tsunami, or now now recently from from the Philippines, people rush in to help, and and it's not a possible to coordinate it well. So one of the challenges of of uh, Myanmar is, of course, to coordinate the help in a in a good and effective fashion, and therefore they are starting. Um, uh, meeting places, networks. There was a donor, the first donor conference um, in, Ma in Myanmar was in January of this year in Naypyidaw, uh, where all the countries were represented. Actually, we were one of the few um, uh, NGOs that were represented. Um, and there was also uh, the network of, of uh, registered NGOs there. Uh, that organized, that meeting ended up with a Naypyidaw Accord that is stating how the donors should work in uh, in Myanmar and how the Myanmar government should receive the help they need. So um, uh, those who are interested can get a copy of that accord. Um, I'm sure if you send a request, I can send it to Stacy. So it could be maybe it could be put out on the library of or on the website of AVPN. There are several networks now growing up to to try to organize um, the, the 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 forest of of uh, NGOs working in in Myanmar, and as far as I know, the most um, relevant networks are PGAE, the Partnership Group on Aid Effectiveness, and the Local Resource Center. Both of these are have websites where you can find information that is relevant. And, and also calls for proposals, etc. So the question of prioritizing projects, what we have been doing is first uh, to define the potential. I will talk a little about that. And then identifying our role in the potential growth of, of Myanmar. And then establishing the presence, our own presence which we have been, so in a way we, we have used the first half year to defining the potential, uh, second half year to identify our role, and now the last half year to establish our presence. And I will talk a little about each of these three. Um, I'm quoting some McKinsey reports that, was, that came out um, uh, in, uh, earlier this year. They did a very interesting study of, uh, of Myanmar's potential for growth and, and the dangers for, for the growth also. And this, uh, this um, report can actually be download, downloaded from the internet. If you look at these, uh, the potential here, they talk about a total of 8% compound growth rate from annual growth rate from 2010 to 2030, which is fairly impressive. And um, if you look at the, um, the the industries, manufacturing, of course, will be the, the one expected to grow the fastest. Agricultural, which is now the largest uh, industry, will also uh, grow to a large extent. And, uh, and this is obvious when you look at the map, because it's a, it's a fantastically uh, arable land. Infrastructure uh, needs to be done very um, both uh, fast and uh, extensive. There is very bad road system, train system, electricity. Only 25% of, of the Burma is, or of Myanmar is now on the grid, electricity grid. And of course, internet. We are lucky to have Barbara on, with us on internet now, but that sort of crossed the fingers and, and hope for, for the best. It's, it's a very bad um, telecommunication system. Then uh, minerals, energy and mining uh, will grow. Uh, there's a lot of resources. Actually, uh, Myanmar is the biggest um, uh, producer of jade in the world, I think, uh, and several of the other uh, precious stones or, or less non-precious stones. There's a lot of uh, um, 
minerals in especially in the Kachin area, which is of course one of the reasons why there is so much conflict in Kachin. Tourism is also a very interesting industry for for Myanmar. And of course financial services because that is so low now, that will grow uh, quite extensively because it's almost non-existent right now. Telecommunication, uh, I am surprised at the low growth they are indicating here because I would think that would be much, much bigger. But here you see, so it's manufacturing, agriculture, infrastructure, minerals, energy and mining, and tourism. And that's where we look at how can, so these would be growth industries and these would be areas where they have competitive advantages. So we look in to see how can we make, help them make a difference on these areas. Within the areas they talk about in the McKinsey report, they, will, they expect 10 million jobs to be created. Uh, most of these jobs will be in manufacturing, 5.8 million. Um, also in infrastructure and in tourism. So there is a great potential for job creation, but we also know there is a huge need for education because these jobs need to be skilled people. And uh, the education system in Myanmar has been really, really down uh, for, for 40 years. So we really have to start from very, very, very bottom line here. And this is one of the, uh, the, the areas where we go in and, and um, see what we can do. Um, so where do we, which role do we have? If you look at the um, uh, Harvard Business Review um, and the Harvard Business, um, uh, yeah, Harvard Business Review uh, um, article on venture philanthropy that is quoted in the ABPN website, uh, there is a definition of sort of the continuum of um, philanthropy, venture philanthropy, where they talk about four stages: angel, early stage, growth, mezzanine and long-term and large-scale impact. We are basically on the two first, um, at this level at least. So we would put ourselves in the angel and early stage area. And here I have listed some of the projects that we are in, and we will talk about them a little later. So I, I have a problem with the, yeah. So establishing presence, what, what, will the, what are the challenges we see? Uh, there is a lot, lot of bureaucracy and for 40 years the, the uh, administration and government has have been forced not to take any decision because it's been less um, dangerous not to take a decision than to take a decision. So uh, the bureaucrats have chosen to sit on papers rather than or let the papers sit on the desk rather than make a decision. So just the fact that for one almost a year we have been applying for um, registration and, and getting an MOU with one of the government, the um, departments, with the government, that takes a lot of time. And then if you have been unlucky to, to apply for, for uh, an MOU the signature at the wrong department, uh, it will take you time to get back to the first one. So this is a hurdle that they really need to work on. And I actually asked um, the Minister of Finance in, um, he was at the Clinton Global Initiative conference this fall and I asked him why why are you doing it so difficult for all of us to help you and he didn't really have an answer to that so he more or less said that um, they would be better and they would improve this uh, work. Um, the other issue that we are meeting also or have met till now is the lack of consist consistency between national and regional government. For example, uh, when we built the heritage, the tourism school that I will talk a little about afterwards, um, we had the okay from national government and then local government came and said, hey, stop, you don't have admission to start building here. So the building process was delayed by three weeks, uh, which was significant because we wanted to do this very fast and, and we did succeed, but it, it's a hurdle that is sort of making things difficult. There is a very huge difference in, in level of, of competence and understanding both within the government, uh, the national government and within the, the regional governments. Um, and as uh, 
Professor Tien Shui says he's at the Chiang Mai University in Thailand. Uh, he says there, there are a lot of changes coming in and they use all the right terminology, the development jargon, and, um, uh, and you, when you listen to them, uh, you get very impressed, but then when it comes to, to actually doing things, it's more difficult. And I think this shows that there is a great willingness to, um, to make the changes happen, but it's difficult to know where to start. And uh, those who are really, um, I, I have heard Chen Sein uh, talk very impressively about all the changes he wants to, to do, and I, I'm, I'm really confident he wants to, but he needs to build a staff that is um, competent at all levels, not only his closest staff, which is really getting better and better, uh, but also downwards and also in the local regions. So what are the opportunities? I would say one of the biggest opportunities in Myanmar is the people. They are eager to change, they have a cultural heritage that they are proud of and that they want to, to rebuild. Um, and they are a fantastic. Uh, uh, they are fantastic people. You don't. You can't help getting to love them very, very fast. And I'm sure Barbara will will uh, agree on that. Uh, there are quite a number. I think it's about between two and three million refugees that or or expats that left Burma in the late 80s and and onward that are now coming back to Burma or to Myanmar because they want to to help change the country. And these have had top education from the best university, they have had top uh, uh, skills training and they are ready to go back to the country and many of them have already done so. The beauty of the country is uh, uh, it's fantastic. So the tourism industry for example will, will be one of the greatest assets um, uh, in the years to come. They have natural resources, they have all the minerals we've been talking about, they have a geographical position, when you look at the map you will see the, this enormous coastline and, and as a sort of a doorway into to huge countries on the, on the east, um, uh, India, China, etc., Thailand. So there is a, and of course there is a lot of uh, minerals uh, out on the, on the coastline also. So what can we, how can we um, work within this, um, is this landscape. We try to see what, what are the uh, competitive advantages that we should be working on. So f step one is of course going for the obvious. Um, tourism is one of those and tourism is also an area where if it's done right it can be really an asset to the country and a, and a development potential of great value. If it's done wrong it can destroy the country. And in a way, Burma, Burma or Myanmar is more um, uh, vulnerable than many other countries because it's uh, some of the areas, for example, in the lake where we are si situated also, it's a very fragile and very closed ecosystem and it has to be taken care of unless it's going to be destroyed within a few years. We build on existing research. I have been quoting the McKinsey report, which is uh, very interesting and I can recommend all of you to, to look at that. Uh, there are various government studies done, both by the, the Myanmar government and also by other countries. Among others, there is an article called Too Much Too Soon, which is um, quite interesting where, they, where, where the, the authors are talking about how the danger of getting too much help into the country too fast so they are not able to absorb it and that sort of the, the help, uh, the, the development aid is uh, taking over rather than helping. And many NGOs have done a lot of good work in, in researching. And uh, so we do not have the capacity to do a lot of research ourselves. So we are using what is existing and we go for the obvious results. So when and then performing due diligence where historic numbers are more or less non-existing is also a challenge. So what we are doing is uh, we have spent a lot of time scoping uh, of scouting. Um, and we also focus a lot on management. The people that we work through, we do spend a lot of time with them. Uh, we have spent a lot of time getting to know them. Um, what are their entrepreneurial skills, management skills, and as especially ethical fiber. Uh, we have 
had some people that we have sort of not uh, worked to continue to work with uh, because we don't feel that the ethical fiber is strong enough. Uh, we have to understand the social goals they have and um, their will, uh, willingness and ability to cooperate and receive support at the, um, uh, the way we see that we can help. And then to our fund, very briefly to explain some of what we are doing. We are focusing on youth and women and also saving the environment. Those are sort of the three pillars for us. We have defined the competitive advantages that we see that where we can go in, which is uh, agriculture, um, uh, sustainable tourism, mostly, uh, identifying marketable solutions. Uh, when we go in, we have to make sure that this is something that will be financially sustainable after we leave. Um, we have found uh, entrepreneurs with track record and we support them both strategically, operationally, and financially. And I will talk a little about that when I give some of the examples of our projects. So with the return we expect, we are grant givers. We give um, what we call entrepreneurial grants, um, which means that we go in in that pioneer gap between where um, an impact investor would go in and where a donor would have been, a, a traditional donor would have been. So. Uh, we give grants for others to build a sustainable uh, social business. Uh, the return on investment will be education and job creation. Uh, and education, as I said, is, is terribly low. Uh, um, the average uh, annual training for, for Myanmar people is four years. Uh, environmental sustainability is uh, the forefront of our, our purpose. Agricultural efficiency, um, the Myanmar arable land is, is, so, uh, is so good that you could grow rice three times a year uh, if you did it right. So there is a huge um, efficiency effect of teaching them to, to grow land efficiently. Uh, we of course want to work with uh, saving the heritage and the awareness of the, the value of the heritage which is important in Myanmar because they have been sort of destroyed for not only during the last 60 years, but also in the years before. Uh, ethnical conflicts, um, as you know, are, I wouldn't say that they are growing, but they, have, um, they are easier seen now. And we want to work with projects where this can be decreased. And of course, the financial sustainability of not only regions and country, but also the projects. So we concentrate on two areas initially, geographical areas. One is the Shan State and the other is Yangon. In the Shan State we have uh, the um, Intervocational Training Center, which is a tourism training center which opened in September of this year. We actually s took the decision in February and during those few months from February to September we had the buildings set up. It's beautiful buildings and I can um, recommend you all to go there. It, this is the most beautiful area in Burma, in Myanmar. And um, uh, where we have built a hotel school in a way, six bungalows where, stu where tourists can live and 40 students are, are going there. And these are students from the poor areas or poor um, families in the area. We have four ethnical groups uh, there. These are all the four groups that are represented in, in um, this area. It's the Intar, it's the Pau, it's the Shan people, and I guess also the Burma. And Barbara may correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, this school will, will train 40 students every year. They can go in, they have guaranteed jobs because the tourist industry is going to grow seven times within 2020. And these, uh, these uh, students uh, learn not only how to take care of the, the, the tourists, but also to take care of their heritage culturally and environmentally. Uh, we have built an English Speaks Community Center, which is um, working with um, uh, awareness building in the lo local area and um, also uh, all kinds of, of uh, uh, education. I will come back to that a little later. 
uh, we are looking into uh, now this week actually we'll be mm -hmm. deciding to to build rebuild the middle school or it's actually from from uh, first grade to I think 12th grade in Nangshui which is the one of the main um, or it's a one it's a main city close to the Inle Lake and we are helping uh, starting a project now to help smallholder farms uh, grow more effectively together with the Norwegian uh, agricultural uh, group here in Norway. In Yangon we are building a young, Yangkin vocational school uh, in partnership with the ORT. ORT is uh, one of the world's largest and oldest vocational training programs uh, internationally. We um, are in the feasibility part of a culture and arts program which is very interesting. We hope to be able to build a house of literature and we seem to have the funding needed for that. We are working closely with former political prisoners for rehabilitation and we are starting now a women entrepreneurship program which will be um, starting in, in January. So uh, the Inter Vocational Training Center is in Inle Lake as I said, 40 students, they go there for 10 months. The, the students come from houses where they live in these uh, houses on the lake and the, and the vocational school is lying on the lake. We have uh, and this program, we are very proud of this program and um, actually when we opened it the um, local leaders were very impressed to see what we had done so quickly. We have an English immersion program where about a hundred students have been um, studying English. Uh, which is of course a prerequisite for their their education further. We have a loans and grants program for the students at the hospitality school. Here are some of the pictures of um, of the school and the students. Uh, the lady on the left there, Emily, is an American um, graduate from Columbia University, I think. Uh, who is one of our teachers, fantastic uh, active women as you can see, she introduced uh, Halloween some later earlier this year. We also have, uh, if you see here on the bottom you can see we have um, uh, organic, uh, um, uh, we, we grow herbs and, and um, vegetables organically to teach also not only the students but also the local community how you can avoid using too much um, fer uh, fertilizer and destroying the water and the lake. Um, we have the Inle Speaks Community Center which I talked about which is uh, on the um, Nangshui town where everybody has to go through to go out of the Inle Lake. Here we have a training of uh, computer literacy, business entrepreneurship, etc. We have cultural events, exhibitions. I think there will be an exhibition in two, two days uh, opening up for tourists uh, of, of uh, paintings that the local community have made, art workshops, etc. And there will be, uh, we are planning to create um, some income generating activities there as we go along. All these things that we are doing with the English Speaks is a pilot that we're going to co uh, copy to other areas and hopefully we'll start with Chin State in, this, uh, in the next month, few months and Chin State is one of the states um, bordering to Bangladesh where there are lots of Muslims uh, with the, um, the issues that we read about in, in the newspapers. The Nang Square Middle School will be um, uh, providing school for 800 students and there, the school there now is it's close it's more or less closed down because it's so bad physically bad and bad access to teachers and uh, this little town will be one of the fastest growing when the industry the tourism industry grows so they really need training Yankin Vocational School is being finished. Hopefully we, we have planned for, for April of this year. Uh, this will be a technical and vocational training uh, school. Um, we used to do this in close cooperation with the ORT and Open Society. So ORT are the actual runners of this program and we are uh, partners with them. Um, 
it will host, in five years, 5,000 students will have had access to this education. This will be a hub and spoke project where we will have spread the, the, the school offerings to other areas of the country also. And in, uh, we also have a culture and arts program coming up. Uh, we are now at the feasibility study there. The head of this program did, did the same in Vietnam. It's just finished. He spent 10 years building a uh, conser music conservatory and philharmonic orchestra in Vietnam. He's going to hopefully do the same in, in Myanmar. What he does now is to identify the musicians that are existing and the orchestras that are ex existing and build upon them like he did in, in Vietnam. Um, we will focus also, of course, on the traditional uh, uh, music, the traditional cultures. Um, so building a, a library of, of traditional music and also uh, creating a theater for gender equality, which is, uh, has been quite a successful attempt in other Asian countries. So um, uh, this is, of course, a huge project, so we need to have ensure that we have funding enough for that for the next five years. But we are the, getting quite a well along here and, and there is a lot of interest in this. And I, we, are, we are sure that the, the importance of culture and arts to sort of be the glue of the, uh, the society, it's so important. Uh, we hope to be able to use, to build a house of literature. Uh, there is a, um, you see, we have, uh, in Norway, we have a house of literature that was created about 10 years ago. And since then, intellectual uh, development has been quite astonishing. Uh, people are all of a sudden getting back to the, the time when you come and listen to speeches, you come and discuss, and you, you present uh, ideas. And it's been a very great success. And we hope to be able to do that also in, in uh, Myanmar. Um, just also both to stimulate local literatures, to stimulate the fantastic poesy, poetry uh, tradition of, of uh, Myanmar, and to host a dialogue groups and sort of train, train in, in dialogue and train in critical thinking and, and general sort of getting together um, on a more cultural basis. Former political prisoners, there are thousands of them. Um, they have been through terrible treatment for 10, 20 years. They have organized to help each other and we are partnering with them to, to help uh, with their development to get back to, to society. Um, finally, a women entrepreneurship program that we are building now. Um, this was actually because a woman in, in uh, not leading one of the a large foundations in Norway, she asked, why don't you create a women entrepreneurship program? And uh, both Barbara and I thought, thought you'd never ask. So, because as, as women entrepreneurs ourselves, uh, we are both very eager to see how we can help uh, women entrepreneurs um, in Myanmar. And there are lots of them already. And what we try to do then is, is help those who are there with English computer skills, marketing training, uh, courses in business development, but also to help uh, transfer their knowledge and their skills and their uh, enthusiasm to potential women entrepreneurs. So to, to help um, build uh, an active um, women entrepreneurship um, society, uh, starting in Myanmar, but we will also use the community centers that we are building all over the country to, to expand this program. So this was uh, sort of my run through of what we're doing and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you so much for this presentation. So I've been receiving quite a few um, questions actually from our audience and um, I'm going to uh, hand them over to you. In the meantime, if the audience has any more questions, please um, key them into the question box uh, in the control panel. So I have, the first question I have is from Small Scale Sustainable Infrastructure Development Fund. Nakul asks, um, what has been your experience working with commercial lending institutions and other financial institutions in Myanmar, if any? Um, 
we have, to be honest, not worked with any commercial uh, financial institutions or, or commercial lending institutions till now. What we have done with our, our student uh, grants and loan program is that we, uh, the first group of students, we will probably be giving them scholarship and then we will build, a, because we want to see how things are working, we are very afraid of doing things wrongly. Um, so we will set up our own lending program for the students and uh, the, the model that we will be using is um, giving them a loan when they start and uh, when they uh, rent uh, a non-rent loan, non-interest loan, and then when they finish, if they get a job, there will be a plan for repaying some of that loan, um, but some of it will be a scholarship. And this is based on the model from the Norwegian scholarship, student scholarship program where all students get their, their university education or their education finance and where, where the, the, the number, what, whatever will be a grant is decided when you start, finish your studies. Okay. But we don't have any, I don't know if Barbara, have you been, Working with any uh, lend commercial lending institutes? Well, <clears throat> for our own projects, we have not. But of course, as we begin to get to know the students and the entrepreneurs, we are learning a little bit about what they experience when they go through the process with um, the typical uh, banks and other commercial organizations. And so. I would say in another six months, we'll have quite a bit more experience. OK, thanks. Uh, the next question is with regards uh, to your vocational schools. So what is the screening process that you use specifically to recruit your incoming students? Do they pay partially for their education at all? And if not, what ways can you ensure a lower attrition rate? Um, uh, Ingrid, maybe, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that what we did in preparation, uh, uh, this would only be relevant for the tourism training school because the other one we haven't started taking in students yet. Uh, but there what we did, we talked with several other similar organizations, for example, um, uh, in, in the UK, we had meetings with um, several tour uh, schools training schools for drug addicts and jobless youth, which of course you cannot compare, but this, the, the situation may be the same. Um, we made sure we met with the families so that the families understood the importance of the education for their children. Uh, uh, but we, it's very difficult to, to go through their, I mean, they don't have any history of, of learning. They don't have any job history. so. You have to trust each person, but, but uh, to, to sort of reduce the risk, we met with all the parents also and, and informed them about the importance of this. And then, Barbara, I'm sure you have more to say about how it's running. But, yes, and I want to emphasize, I mean, what Ingrid said is absolutely correct. We, and also, there was no, um, no fee or charge for them to apply. We wanted to encourage as many students and young people as possible to apply and then they went through a process of, of uh, selection using you know both written work and exams as well as all of the extensive interviews that Ingrid talked about. I think as we and again to Ingrid's point when we extend our vocational programs we will probably have different different application processes for different kinds of vocational training. If you're going to become a telecommunications technician, that will be a different process than the one we're using for the tourism and hospitality. So I think we will, again, look to people who have really good experience in each of the unique vocational areas and learn from these um, experienced people. Okay, the follow-up question um, still with regards to your schools is, where do the other teachers come from for the Inter Center? What are their qualifications? And is there a plan to eventually give the leadership or ownership over to the locals? Uh, 
the, the ownership is already there by the locals, so it's owned totally by the locals. Um, and um, uh, the teachers are, uh, the English teachers are English students from the, um, uh, yeah, you can, I guess you can respond to where, where they are. This is from the uh, Princeton in Asia, is it, Barbara? You can respond to that. Yes, um, at the vocational school there are currently three English teachers, two of whom come from the United States and are, are part of a program similar to Princeton but run by Stanford. One of the teachers is a young woman with a master's in English from uh, Townji, a town, uh, the state capital of the Shan State. The other four teachers are all uh, people who grew up in this area locally were trained at one of the very um, high quality hotels and then gave up their um, positions to come and be a teacher trainer in the vocational school. So for food preparation, food service, housekeeping, and front desk and reception, all of these people are <coughs> local uh, uh, people who have very extensive both local and international experience and then the three English teachers. Okay, um, anything else to add on to that, Ingrid? No? No. Okay, so I have another question with regards to the hospitality. What um, from SE Hub in Singapore actually? What is the potential for hospitality and tourism training in Bagan? Uh, any idea on that? We we are planning to uh, expand. Um, uh, we are we are looking about what we are doing in Shan State as a pilot where we can sort of learn and expand to other areas as soon as we have these up and running. And when we talk about due diligence, um, what we have chosen to do is, as we know the area now quite well, and we know the locals very well, especially Barbara has become very close friends with most of them, we, we know it's better, easier for us to sort of grow up in that area and, and learn uh, where, we, where we have so close relations that we that the due diligence is, is sort of an, an ongoing uh, thing uh, as, as we are part of it. And then we will expand. And of course, Bagan will be one of the, the major tourist areas. So uh, that is absolutely a potential for us to start a tourism training program. OK, next we have a question from our good friend Rob at NUS. Are the organizations you make enterprise grants to potentially sustainable businesses? Some of them look like development projects that will always need grants. Have you, uh, have any yet moved on to impact investment funding? Yeah, we, we uh, for example, the tourism training program will be sustainable, financial sustainable. Um, so that would be a uh, sort of financially um, break-even uh, project in a very short time. Uh, the school in, in Nangshui will be built as a grant, but the government has, uh, has uh, taken on the responsibility to run the school. So that will also be, uh, when we have built the school and helped them set it up, uh, that is expected to be an ongoing uh, project. Um, so, um, the culture and arts program, of course, culture will, even in Norway, cultural programs uh, need heavy subsidy. Uh, but what we see is, if you look at some of the, the uh, uh, investment analysis from, from Myanmar, there is enormously uh, um, fast-growing middle class and upper middle class, and they will uh, need a cultural program. Uh, so we believe that that going into these areas, uh, there will be sustainability at some level, but we are not impact investing as such right now. There could be that when we have come a little further, and, and Myanmar has come a little further, that we will set up a pure impact investing fund. But right now, we see our role as being, being the one to help getting projects in the pipeline for impact investors. 
So we look upon ourselves as the, st the stage before the acumen funds and the um, the, uh, the funds that, that are more uh, impact investors. Fantastic. Uh, we have a few more questions here from uh, Synergy Social Ventures in Hong Kong. She's asking about your funding criteria. What is your funding criteria? What kind of non-financial support do you provide and for how long? How do you deal source and what is your funding range? Okay, so, um, so the criteria, as, as we said, we do not take applications. We go in and, and look at what are, the, what, what are the competitive advantages in that area, how can we help the, the, the local uh, community um, sort of um, use those competitive advantages to create development. And, um, uh, so, and then our support is both in terms of, for example, with the, uh, the heritage uh, school, the, the tourism school, we helped build the curriculum the head, the owner of the school was uh, traveling with us to Cambodia, to the UK, meeting with uh, Jamie Oliver to learn how to run uh, uh, the training program, meeting with uh, several tourism, uh, several good examples from, from Cambodia and Thailand. Um, so, uh, and, and of course she's a very well educated uh, hotel owner, uh, but just to help her create this curriculum. Uh, Barbara is working very closely with them. Actually, Barbara did the the, fir the first English immersion program herself and ran it. I'm sure you could say a lot about that. So we are operationally very active in the beginning, and then we fade out as we see it possible. And uh, the size of the grants uh, will vary from ten thousand dollars to uh, what we have given. The largest one now will be around one point eight million dollars when it's finished the the, uh, the vocational school but of course in, in Yangon but of course the um, the culture and arts program will be huge I, I mean when we succeed with that will be about a million dollars a year for five years this is US dollars right yeah okay we have another funding question from Hong Kong um, what about co-funders are you open to co-funding certain programs absolutely we are actively uh, looking at uh, co-funders because we don't have a huge fund ourselves. We apply, we come up with proposals and and, and, um, and co-funders are more than welcome. Fantastic. I'll, I'll link the two of you up. <laughs> this is another foundation. Because I can recommend you our, our, local, our local, I mean Barbara is a wonder. Great. <laughs> She's a fantastic person and I've never seen somebody going so deeply and actively into projects and making sure they succeed without taking over, with just helping, mm -hmm. empowering the, the, the people we help with. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question again about, um, about uh, the management of your school grants. Do you foresee partnering with any organizations for the loan management program as your school gains traction and more students? Would you conduct loan management in-house? Yeah. No, we wouldn't do that because then, then we would have to build uh, the organization for that. So we we uh, we would welcome uh, partners on that. We are built on the partnership thinking, so uh, we believe that together we get much much more done. Fantastic. So okay. Anybody who wants <laughs> to come up with their, their expertise and, and their skills and and financial resources, we welcome. Great. One last question now. Um, how do you enforce the collection of micro loan from for the scholarships after their graduation? Well, as I said, we haven't. W this first year is a is a test year for us to see how we should do this. So the good news for for the present students is that they will get get these as grants uh, totally. Uh, the income, of course, of this school seventy five percent of the of the costs are covered by tourists live, staying at the school. Mm. So it's only 25% of the cost for the students that we need to, that, that the school needs to take as, as uh, school fees. So it's not a very large sum. Uh, we are giving it as grants this year because we need that, to do that to learn. And then we will create a, a, a loan system for that. Um, and the way we are, are thinking of doing that is um, to, to uh, 
uh, let the, the job, the, the employer uh, pay half of it at least, and then the student pay on a sort of a five-year plan to, re to reduce the, on a monthly plan. Like we, we do in Norway, you get the, um, every four, I think it's four times a year, you have to repay and it's going for 20 years or something. So it's more mm -hmm. like, it's a more symbolic way of doing it than a really financial way. Okay, great. And these, of course, with, the, with this tourism industry mm -hmm. growing seven times within the next five years, there's going to be jobs for these people. Ten million jobs, as we saw on the slide, are going to be created. And they lack every trained, skilled person in the world. They, they need every kind of skilled people in Myanmar for the next ten, ten years. Okay, uh, we don't have any more questions now. Would uh, Barbara or Ingrid like to add on anything? If not, I'll be wrapping this up. Um, the only thing that, that I would add, this is Barb, the projects that we are doing, we always look to the potential for replicating them or leveraging them. And so in Inley Lake, we have this portfolio or or pyramid of projects where we start with basic skills like English and computer literacy. Then we help the young adults with some vocational training. And we use these projects like Inley Speaks, the Community Awareness Center, to help build their leadership and their professional skills. And that sort of model, you can pull parts of it out. So in Inley we have tourism and hospitality vocational training, but in Yangon, while we might include tourism and hospitality, we would probably also include very practical skills like building construction and small engine repair, as well as basic business and office work. But that same model of sort of basic skills, then specific vocational skills, and then the softer but more professional skills um, appears to be a very attractive model to our colleagues who are business and community leaders in other parts of Myanmar. And so we will see projects like that next year get started in some, to, I think Ingrid mentioned this earlier, in, in part of Western and Northern uh, Myanmar, as well as in cities like Yangon. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, Ingrid, anything else to comment? No, I think that was a good conclusion from Barbara. <laughs> Thank you so much for finding the time to do this too, Ingrid. Okay, thank you everyone for this very engaging session. I hope you have found it helpful and informative. We look forward to your continued participation in ABPN activities. Do give us your feedback and if you would like Ingrid's contact information plus presentation, we will be sharing these shortly on our website too. Our next webinar is on 15th January and will feature Professor Mai Tree, Myanmar Studies expert, will delve into the political climate of the country and how it will affect foreign players looking to be involved in Myanmar. Please register for this on our website. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Stacey. <laughs>